Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It's, um, it's 10 o'clock and um, we're just about to kick in into our second lecture of the Ramadan uh, lecture series. And today we have the subject, the intricacies of parenting in the midst of social media blueprint. We are happy to have uh, with us Imam Najim Jima, who will be making, who will be talking to this topic. He is not a stranger um, in our midst, having in the last couple of years uh, given us um, his thoughts on wide-ranging subject. Um, I don't want to take uh, too much of his own time, considering what happened um, last week. Uh, the lecturer utilized nearly all the time to present a very uh, technical subject to us. So I'm just going to give a short um, introduction of um, Imam Jima from what we have with us. Imam Nojim Jima is a man of many firsts. He became the first ever to graduate with a first-class honors degree in political science in the history of the University of Lagos in 1986. He became a university scholar as he was awarded a scholarship with which he completed his master's degree at the same institution in 1988. He is now a British citizen he relocated, as a British citizen, he relocated to the United Kingdom in 1989, where he secured his first job in the housing sector. Not one to do things by half, he was quick to secure an employer sponsorship with which he completed his postgraduate diploma in housing policy, finance, and management. This was at Middlesex University in London. He described the highlight of his career as the five years he spent as strategic commissioner for housing and support at the city of London. This was between 2003 and 2008. In his words, the UK government launched a new national program of housing related support for vulnerable members of the community. It was known as the Supporting People Program. A group of professional, professional commissioners known as strategic commissioners were appointed up and down the country and Najim became the strategic commissioner for the city of London. His professional accomplishments and academic feat were recognized by the city, i.e. the city of London, which in 2005 presented him an award for his imagination and innovation, especially on the implementation of the housing and support program. He says without any fear of con contradiction that he was the first 1% of Nigerians who lived in the United Kingdom during the 20 years that he lived there. You'll be wondering whether it's a housing conversation we are going to have or a religious conversation. 
But Imam Jimo has seen metamorphosed into an Imam, a knowledgeable Imam, and he's going to be talking to us about the scale of the moment. How do we parent as Muslims in the era of social media? Before I invite him, I want to thank all those who have um, made it to the platform this morning. Internet has been a nightmare, and we all now understand what happened, the natural um, phenomenon. And um, if our number doesn't reach the usual, and it doesn't suggest that it may, it may not, we'll um, understand that internet has been a problem. And if anything happens on the platform, because just as you are, I am also a sufferer of the incident. Please be assured that we will restart the program. I don't think anything will happen. We'll restart the program if it happens like that and um, make sure that internet that brought us together does not separate us. Without much further ado, may I invite Imam Jimo to make his presentation. Thank you. He joined the platform. I saw him coming, but now I can't find him. Again, let's just bear with him for one second, and I'll try and um, locate him again. Maybe he lost um, Imam Jimo, if you are hearing me. Okay, I think I'm in again. Ah, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, yeah. One minute, please. Okay. In Alhamdulillah, in Ahmaduhu, wa nasta'inuhu, wa nasta'ufur, wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina, wa min sayyiyati amalina, إنه من يأدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك أميد وجيت All praises due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى We thank him, we glorify him We seek his assistance and forgiveness and we seek Allah's continuing peace, blessings, and benedictions upon our noble prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, members of his household, his companions, and all of us believers. And we beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has counted us amongst the witnesses to the start of this Ramadan, to let all of us be here upon the conclusion of the same and to accept it from us. Amen. Having praised Allah, we extend our gratitude to the Adiola's family for providing this platform through which we attempt on a yearly basis to educate and to benefit each other on topics of relevance to the everyday life of a Muslim. Beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to count these 
on their scale of good deeds, reward them here and in the hereafter. Amen. Before we go into our topic, I felt embarrassed when uh, Uncle Fola started to read my profile, uh, and that was one of the many disruptions that the internet has uh, caused. Um, that profile was not meant for this audience at all. Indeed, that was a profile from my housing world, and it was meant for a professional housing audience. And uh, from the very first line, I knew I had sent the wrong profile to him. Indeed, I mean, I've left housing one and a half decades ago, and uh, I've been in uh, oil and gas since then, which does not even feature in the profile that was uh, Red. Having said that, yeah, the provider that was red was indeed me, albeit the wrong profile for the wrong audience. Our topic of discussion as advertised is the intricacies of parenting in this era of social media. With the social media potentially having more influence on the upbringing of our wards than us, parents of these children. By the way, just before we started, someone sent to me what is supposed to be the right code to join this platform that uh, apparently a wrong code was uh, previously sent out and that uh, the right code is now something different. I imagine the organizers are very much aware of that and then uh, in possession of the right code as well. So we live in an era in which the social media potentially has more influence on our words and our children than we the natural and biological parents of those children. In this talk, I intend to share with us what in Islam we call tarbiyat atfal, i.e. child rearing in Islam. I intend to share with us one or two examples of social media parents, otherwise known as influencers. And I intend to share with us a real life consequence or consequences of the lives or outcomes of decisions of one or two young people who submitted to social media parenting. And I do have personal stories to share as well as to how against all odds, I am this imam who is talking to you today, and then we we'll draw our conclusions. So we start with the words of Allah. Allah says to us in Surah to nahl that is the Quran, chapter 16, verse 18, Allah says, وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعِمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوَا Meaning that if we make efforts to count the blessings of Allah on us, we will not be able to exhaust the counting of those blessings. As our parents would say, our parents would say, She ore pe abapa o she be abia no se o she no shun la kani. Meaning that, where do we start to count the blessings, the favors of Allah upon us? Our lives, our health, our family, our wealth, and more than all of these being rightly guided. That which of these can we thank Allah enough? But brothers and sisters, of these many blessings, the blessing of a new child or new children who tend to rank right above many others of these blessings. For most, for very many people, it is the ultimate blessing, i.e. that you have reproduced yourself. Allah has blessed you with a reproduction of yourself so much so that sometimes 
when you would look at your children, you will see your exact self in some of these children. You will see your spouse in these children. You will see your parents in these children. And that is what having a child means. A new child gives hope. And this applies to all parents, rich and poor, educated, non-educated, white or black. Even those who are not religious, they get this renewed hope in their children. So a child gives hope. The ability to bestow this blessing of a new child, Allah says, is exclusively is. And this is says to us in Surah to Shura, that is Quran chapter 42, verses 49 to 50. Allah says to us, Lillahi muliku samawati wa ala arudi yakhluku ma yasha, ya'bu liman yasha wa inatha, wa ya'bu liman yasha wa dhukur, au yuzawijuhum dhukurona wa inatha, wa yaj'alu ma yasha wa akima, inna wa alimun qadir. Meaning that to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. Yahluku ma yasha. He creates as he wills. Ya bulimai yasha wa inatha. When it pleases him, he blesses a couple with a female child. And yet at other times, he blesses them with a male child. Allah it is who also blesses with male and female to the same couple. Sometimes at the same time, such that they would have a set of twins, boy and girl. But then Allah says, He says, He is also the one who makes a person to be barren. He says, He is the one with the knowledge of why He does all this, i.e., why he gives to A and not to B. Why he gives to he who does not even acknowledge the existence of Allah and he, de he declines the same blessing to the one who is a worshiper of Allah. He says, not only is he the one with the ability to do this, he is also the one with the knowledge of doing it. So if Allah, when it comes to this blessing, Allah does not discriminate. Being religious does not guarantee having a child, just as being irreligious does not make you to be barren. And this is because Allah says elsewhere in his book, Surah to la araf chapter 7, verse 156, Wa rahmati kulla shay'in. My rahma, my mercy, it transcends all things. And uh, that is what in Yoruba they will say, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Oba Jokaye, Oba Shakyoru, the one who blesses all of us here on earth, but who would bless and favor by discrimination in the Akhirah. So we will move on to parenting, i.e. responsibilities towards our children. Children, once we are blessed with them, they become an aman, i.e. a trust on us. And our responsibilities over them become their rights over us. Let me repeat that last line. Islamically, the responsibilities that we have towards our children are rights that the children have over us. And in Islam, the first right of a child over his or her parent comes before he or she will be born. 
tall. And you may ask me, what is the first right of a child in Islam? And I will need the attention of our sisters, especially in this regard, our wives. What is the first right of a child in Islam? A child yet unborn. A child yet unborn has a right to pure lineage. In this regard, the mother carries a lot of responsibilities in ensuring that the child to be born by her will be born under proper marital circumstances. And to a man, a child will grow up to know and be proud of. And our sisters are the ones who have control of this. In the Islamic home, Islamic family, Islamic setting, the paternity of a child should never be in doubt. This is official to an extent. Nigeria has the second highest rate of paternity fraud in the world. Jamaica is number one. Jamaica is regarded as the country with the highest level of paternity fraud, i.e. giving a child to the wrong father. In Nigeria, our country is believed to be number two in the world. And what is my source? I have at least three sources for you containing reports of different studies and research published in different newspapers. Number one, the Vanguard newspaper of January 10, 2021. The title, three out of 10 Nigerian men are not biological fathers of their children. Vanguard newspaper, January 10, 2021. Number two, Punch newspaper, December 16, 2023. The title is Paternity Fraud, Shocking Revelations as More Couples Embrace DNA Testing. Report number three, Guardian newspaper, November 17, 2023. And the title, Paternity Fraud in Nigeria, unveiling the hidden truth. So across these reports, we find that in Nigeria, our Nigeria, or the Nigeria of our time, one out of every four children is given to the wrong father, i.e. the person that the child knows as his father is not his father. And the mother would tend to know that the person that that child calls daddy is actually not the daddy, the father of that child. One of those reports tells us that majority of the children in Nigeria grieving to wrong fathers are firstborns, usually the firstborns of the ladies. And this is how it happens, right? Now, I'll, I'll share a personal experience here. Sometime around 2011 or 2012, I was invited to an aid celebration in the house of a person who is a friend of a friend and of a friend. And in this house was a young lady serving us, catering to our needs and everything, right? But after a while, I noticed that the lady was nowhere to be found. I noticed that one of us was equally nowhere to be found. What is happening? Where are these people? And then somebody else told me, well, I have friends online listening to this who are witnesses to this event, right? One of us that we were there together on this day, on that day told me that that lady who was serving us was going to get married that weekend and uh, she only came to spend her last night with her sugar daddy before her marriage which was coming in the weekend that same weekend that we were there so a lady who was going to get married on saturday 
on Tuesday or Wednesday was spending time with a sugar daddy boyfriend and then she will get married. The chances of her taking a pregnancy from that encounter to her innocent husband is very high indeed. Number two, some of us would have read in the newspapers in 2020, the Canada visa story. Let me leave out the names of the people, even though this is a public event. The husband was an Igbo guy by his two names and the wife, a Yoruba lady. They needed to do DNA as part of their visa application to go to Canada. And it turned out that one of the three children did not belong to that man. And what did the man do? He killed the lady. This was in Lucky Phase 1 here. He killed the lady in the most brutal manner. And then he drank poison himself. And he did this in the presence of their three young children. So those children had two dead parents in the house. And the bodies were not discovered for at least 24 hours, maybe longer after that, with those children around them. So, brothers, to all of you brothers who have more than one wife, but whose mothna, i.e. the second or third or whatever number, whose mothna came about as a result of zina, i.e. adulterous relationship with the lady, then the, the child that the lady may have given you may well not be your child, i.e. You had no intention of Islamically marrying a second or a third or a fourth wife. You are only doing zina. And then the lady got pregnant and she wouldn't abort this pregnancy. Right? Right? So to save face, right, you now accept and you announce to the world that you are taking a second or whatever number of wife. Right? The chances that the child, the first child that that lady has given you is not yours. It's very high because a lady who is having an adulterous relationship with a married man, per chance or very highly likely also has another boyfriend, perhaps the person she actually intends to marry on the side. And of course, when she gets pregnant, the one who has money is the one she's going to give the child to. So if you are in this situation, then I would say go and have a DNA done for that child who came out of that adulterous relationship. So in Islam, the paternity of a child should never be in doubt. And our sisters owe it to their yet unborn children, the right for that child to be born into a pure lineage. Let's move on. The next part of our talk is Taribiya to la Atifal, i.e. child rearing in Islam. In Islam, a new child is expected to be nursed with breast milk for a full term of two years. And this is an ayat of the Quran, which you can find in chapter 2, verse 233. Allah says in Surah to the Bakara, say wali wali datu, yuri deina, awla da hunna, awlaini, kamilaini. The man aro the ain yutimma arodoa. Ai, the mothers shall give suck to their children for two whole years for those who wish to complete the term. And this is part of the mercies of Allah. Right, the ayat says, for those who wish to complete the term, meaning that it is not compulsory to complete the two years. However, Islam expects the mother to consult her husband, <clears throat> excuse me, to consult her husband if she decides to win the baby. And we find in the same ayat, that the man has a responsibility for making sure that 
the wife does not lack during this period. So his provision for her should be even more emphasized during this time that she is breastfeeding the child. I acknowledge that it is very difficult to have to breastfeed a child for two years, especially in the poverty stricken circumstances that we found ourselves in which the mother is under pressure to return to work. For those are the words of Allah. Secondly, it is part of Taribiya to La Atifal to give our child a good name. Ideally, a name which identifies them as Muslim children. And the best person or the best people to name a child are the parents of that child. You know, we have this culture, and I'm not saying it is wrong. Indeed, Islamically, it is acceptable. We have this culture in which grandparents give names to their grandchildren, right? We have an example of this traceable to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his grandson Hassan, that we've all heard about. It wasn't the name Hassan that the father, that is Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was husband to Fatima, who was the daughter of the Messenger of Allah. Now, Ali was a nephew of the Messenger of Allah, and he had been brought up in the house of the messenger of Allah. And then he married Fatima, the daughter of the messenger of Allah. And when Fatima gave birth, the messenger of Allah asked Ali, what name do you have in mind for this child? And he mentioned a name and the, and the prophet said, why don't you call him Hassan? And that was how that name came about. So Islamically, it is perfectly in order for grandparents to name their children. But this is where the problem is. Often, the parents of those children do not like the names given by the grandparents. And there'll be many listening to me who would have one experience or another of this because the names that are trendy with our parents are not necessarily trendy with ourselves, just as the names that will be trendy with our children when they start to have children will be different from the kind of names that we give. As such, the best people to name the children are the parents of those children. Otherwise, the reason a lot of people do not call their children by their Muslim names is because those names were given by grandparents and they themselves as parents of those children, they do not like the names. So they'll just forget about that name. And uh, I once listened to Pastor Tunde Bakari. Pastor Bakari was a Muslim before he became a Christian and became a pastor. And uh, he said that his Muslim name said was... Said that his Muslim name was... Okay, I, okay, I just heard myself echo, but I think it's gone now. Now, Pastor Bakari said his Muslim name was uh, Sindiku. And he said he did not like that name at all. And I assure you, brothers, nobody would like the name Sindiku. What is Sindiku? Compare Sindiku to Siddiq. Comp compare it to Sodiq. Compare it to Sodiq, right? Whereas you and I are like to give our child, right, Siddiq, our parents will be likely to give that child Sindiku, right? And no one of my generation will be likely to call their child Sindiku. And this is what happens when names are given by parents. So it is part of Taribia to La Atifal that our children are given names that we will love, the children we love as well. Next is education. And this includes religious education, letting a child know his creator 
have a love of the prophet, the divine books, believe in the hereafter, and other important aspects of the day. This would include all beneficial education, including so-called Western and Islamic education. I have a family close to me here, living literally opposite my house, and they are three boys, and I always hold them as a model in terms of balancing, giving our children the best of both worlds, each of their three children. When they finished secondary school, they put them in Quran Memorization College for two years. And then after they had memorized the Quran, they sent them to university. And all three boys, as I speak with you, are in university in the UK. One is in his final year, one is in the second year, one is in his first year. These boys were sent to receive the best of Western education in the UK after having memorized the Quran here in Nigeria. Now, parents who can afford to have free children in the UK at the same time are not the typical parents who send children to Quran memorization college. And this is exactly what these parents did. And they are not our fathers at all. Far from, it, far from it. They are not our fathers or anything like that, but very conscious Muslims who have then given their children the best of both worlds. The final aspect of this Taribiya to La Atfal is to live a life of righteousness, i.e. for us as parents to live a life of righteousness, bearing in mind that we are the mirror through which our children see the world. As such, if we are going to demand goodness from our children, then we have to live by example. And I'll draw the curtains there on Taribiya to la atfal, i.e. child rearing in Islam. I want to move to social media. And these I have titled in competition with Daddy and Mommy Google. Brothers and sisters, all of you, all of us parents, we have got a competitor in raising our children. The competitor is called Daddy Google or Mommy Instagram. If you like, you can add Uncle Facebook and you can add Auntie TikTok. Whereas you may be present and sometimes absent in the lives of these children, Daddy Google and Mommy Instagram are permanently present. They do not go anywhere. And chances are they are more committed to raising your children than you are. You are. And what I'm going to do next is give you examples of Nigerian Google parents who have become role models to our children. The first of this is Hush Puppy. Hush Puppy is currently serving a jail term in America. And I'm sure there is no one listening to me who has not heard of or known about Hosh Puppy. Hosh Puppy is a Muslim. His name is Abdul Rahman Abbas, but he calls himself Rahman Abbas. And the reason I'm freely mentioning his name is because this is a decided case, conviction, and a person in prison. And this is the story of Hosh Puppy. Now, in Dubai, headed women gang specializing in cyber fraud. And then he had a partner, Chibuzo, based here in Nigeria. Chibuzo was an expert in web design, very good by the accounts. Chibuzo was able to mirror the website of Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is a well known bank in. America, an international bank. 
So Chibuzo built a website and that website was not different in any way with the website of Wells Fargo. And it was able to replicate on this website all the features that you find in the website of Wells Fargo. So there was this Qatari businessman, a businessman from Qatar, who needed a loan from Wells Fargo. And this person was interacting with Hoshopi and his gang all online. And all the time he was interacting with this Chibuzo created website, he thought he was interacting with the real Wells Fargo in America. And the gang succeeded in, du du in duping this person to the amount of $1.1 million. They got him to pay money into certain accounts as evidence that he asked the seed fund. And he paid one point one. He didn't pay it in one go. He paid this amount. Then they told him to add this and to add this. And in all, he paid one point one million naira. So working with another team of Nigerian criminals based in America, Hush Puppy paid himself handsomely from the proceeds of this crime. But Hush Puppy underpaid Chibuzo. In anger. Chibuzo contacted the businessman in Qatar and he revealed the identity of Hoshbop. So the Qatar businessman contacted security agents in his homeland who contacted the FBI in America and this was how Hoshbop's cover got blown. So it wasn't enough stealing this much from this person, right? He tried to steal even from his gang member, right? And in anger, that one decided to lose everything. And as I'm sure you all know, there is more angle to this story, which I'm unable to mention here, because this is an ongoing scenario, because there is an angle of a certain security personnel in Nigeria who was linked to this story, but I will leave that out as that is an ongoing case. So as at the time of his arrest, Hush Puppy's followership on social media was in the millions. He displayed his ill-gotten wealth without restraint and many young people wanted to be like him. So brothers and sisters, that's a social media parent for you. And that is Daddy Google. Hush Puppy is a brilliant example of a daddy Google. I'll tell you about another daddy Google, and that is Invictus Obi. All of us would have heard about him as well, those of us who follow the media, right? Now, Invictus Obi was an extremely young man, as extremely wealthy young man and again i'm able to mention his name because he's serving a jail term as i talked to you he was an extremely wealthy young man and globally renowned businessman with interest in oil and gas and telecom in real estate and in alternative energy where did this money come from from cyber crimes these were the original 419ers amongst us in Nigeria. He made his money from wire fraud. He was an internet fraudster who, by the time of his arrest in America in 2019, he had defrauded Americans to the tune of $40 million. In America alone, he was doing this scam across the world, right? But he had defrauded Americans to the tune of $40 million through different scams. And of this, $11 million was traced to his account, was accounted for by the time of his arrest and the time of his sentence. $40 million at today's exchange rate of 1,500 to 1, 
is 60 billion naira. This was the amount of money right. found in the account of Invictus Obi at the time of his sentencing. He was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment in February 2021. And how did he get arrested? He had close. So he flew from Nigeria to America, not knowing that he was already under the watch of American security officers. And they followed him as he went about and they waited till he did all that he needed to, to do in America on his way to the airport. That was when they grabbed him, Victor's Obi, right? Credit to our sisters, I actually tried to look for an example of a mother in this mode, but I couldn't find one, i.e. one who has actually been sentenced, convicted. I couldn't find any Nigerian lady that I could use as a perfect example of uh, internet parent. There are, but I'm saying not one that has been convicted of anything. Even as I speak, I have in my head names that are archetypal internet parents to your children, but I cannot mention them at this point in time. And what I'm going to do next, is to look at one or two internet children, i.e. young people who submitted themselves to internet parenting and what became of them. But before I do this, let me acknowledge that I am occupying a position of immense privilege. By being the one talking to all of you at this point, in time, right? There are on this platform people old enough to father me. And yet, here am I talking to people in their 70s and in their 80s on how to father or to parent their children. My youngest daughter is 13 years old, so I'm a long way from being a successful parent myself. Yet, here am I being listened to by these many people. All our elders at Lekki Central Mosque, they follow these programs from their comments from previous ones. Some of them are old enough to parent me, and here am I lecturing people on how. So I'm quite humbled to be doing this. But let me also tell you one permanent disadvantage that people in my position are. Because we are the ones who invite or who are invited to tell people how to live their lives, people naturally assume that everything is hunky-dory about our lives. Everything is brilliant about our lives. I'm telling you, not necessarily so at all. And I'll give you an example from last year on this platform, right? I spoke to you about marriages and homes with two different religions, right? Let me tell you, that exists in my family too. The first husband that my immediate senior sister of the same parents, the first husband that she married was a Christian. And my sister became a Christian. It was a devastating blow to my father especially us, that was the first of our children to get married. As far as my father was concerned, he failed because in his lifetime, his daughter became a non-Muslim. But Allah brought my sister back to Islam in a miraculous way, which we do not have the time to go to on this platform and today she's a mother mother to some of the most wonderful muslim children my father's only sister married a christian and lived the entirety of her life as a christian she's dead now but all our children who are my first cousins are christians and they are very close to us 
So this learning that we are doing together, the speaker is as much a beneficiary as are the listeners. And I feel the need to inject this because I am aware from many phone calls that I talk of last year, touched raw nerves in places. Believe me, we are in this together. And one year after, there's still reference to that talk as well. So excuse me for that uh, indulgence. Uh, that came to my head and I felt I should uh, do it. So back to our internet daughter. The first internet daughter that I will talk about is Cynthia. Cynthia was so cool. Cynthia was born in Abo in Delta State. She was the only daughter of her parents. Cynthia made friends on Facebook with a group of young men, including one Echezona in Wabufa and AGK Ilechuku Ulisaloka. Cynthia was living in Abuja when these young men, young evil men, when they lured her to a hotel under the pretext of business, somewhere around Festac in Lagos. The proposition made to her was too good to believe, so much so that she left Abuja for Lagos, believing that she was going to meet people who would change her life for the better. This was in July 2012. On arriving in the hotel and meeting the people who turned out to be young criminals, she was drugged, she was tied up, she was robbed, she was raped, and Cynthia was strangled to death. The two men were found guilty of her murder in March 2017, and both sentenced to death in a trial which lasted for five years. The other, so that, so that is what happens when our children take to internet parenting so much so that they are no longer able to differentiate between fiction and reality. Cynthia paid the ultimate price in a brutal manner and an only child for that matter. The second person I would have liked to talk to you about, I am unable to mention her name right now, but many of us, because this is more recent, I can tell you that uh, she was a 300 level female student of the University of Lagos, and she was involved with the CEO of a television company. And that relationship led to the death of that TV boss. The same person went on to take part in a beauty pageant while in prison and actually winning beauty pageants. But I am unable to mention names as this is an ongoing case. But brothers and sisters, this is what happens when Daddy Google, my Instagram, <clears throat> When they take control of your child, some of these, our children are wild beyond our imagination as parents. We cannot allow children unfettered access to the internet without interest in what they do online. This is one battle that we as parents, we cannot afford to lose. Allah says to us in Surah to Tagabun, say, Ya ayu alladhina aman, inna min azwajikum wa awladikum adu waldakum fahdaru. Meaning, that verily amongst your spouses, amongst your wives and children will be enemies for you. So be aware of this. A young man or lady with no obvious source of income suddenly starts to display wealth beyond everyone's comprehension, beyond everyone's imagination. This should be an immediate cause for concern for every parent. As the Yorubas would say, Omanyoshabafo, 
your child does not run a laundry service and yet he or she comes home with different attires, then what you are saying is a thief. Get in there. In the same surah, Allah says, In your wealth and your children are but a trial for you. In Surah to Tahrim, Quran verse Quran chapter 66, verse 6, Allah says, Ya ayu alladina aman, who am fusakum wa ahli kum nara, wa kudu an nasu wa li hijaru tu alayya mala ikatun giladun, she dad, la ya asun Allah ma amarahum, wa ya fadun ma yu'marun. O oh, you who have believed, protect yourself and your families from a fire whose fuel is mankind and stones. The fire that is guided by angels who do not disobey their lords and who do as they are commanded. By the law, each of these ayat starts with, Ya ayyuhal ladina amal. Meaning that Allah is talking to you and me who have subjected ourselves to Islam. And what is Allah warning about here? It's warning about the consequences of the absence of the right upbringing for our children. And may Allah protect us from this. Some parents would end up in paradise, not necessarily because they have earned it, but because they would have raised the righteous children, these righteous children would intervene on their behalf on the day of Qiyam. But the reverse is also a possibility, i.e. parents meeting the displeasure of Allah because of the children that they have abandoned and who end up as scums of the earth. May Allah save us from this. The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in one of his many sayings that on the day of Qiyam, parents of children who memorized the Quran and lived the life of righteousness will be clothed in a special garment. They will be made to wear a special garment. And then these parents would ask, why have we been dishonored? And it will be said to them, this is your reward for letting your child memorize the book of Allah and for guiding that child. May Allah count us amongst such parents that will be so honored like that. I'm coming to a close and I want to share a personal story that I have called my cinema going story from my youthful days. You see, the tendency to be with would always be there in a young person, especially in the teenage years. And this will be even more so where you are surrounded by boys and girls who are lacking parental control. I was born in the Butimeta here in Lagos and somewhere close to the third mainland bridge. As you come down the third mainland bridge to Adekunle, turning right to Abad Macaulay Road towards Yaba, I was born somewhere around there, right? And uh, I had friends who are my age groups, who are my classmates, two of them especially, and they were free to do as they liked. We had close to our house there in Ebutemeta on Lagos Street. Those who know Ebutemeta well, if you come down Third Mainland Bridge, if you assume that you turn left rather than right, right, you come to Carter Street, McCollum Street, Moloney Street, Glover Street, and Lagos Street, walking in the direction of Oyibo, right? Now, we had a cinema called Central Cinema. And in the cinemas were only, uh, films were only shown at night between seven and nine p.m. And uh, my friends 
will go to watch film at Central Cinema. And the following day in school, they will tell us how she went, Amitabh Bachchan, Vinod Kanan, and stuff like that. And it became almost a lifetime ambition for me to also go to this cinema one day, right? So something took over me and I joined them in going to this cinema. Meaning that I was going to be absent at Maghrib. I was going to be absent at Isha. Isha was going to come and go. Nobody was going to find me anywhere. I was in a film house, Central Cinema, Lagos Street. So the film finished and we returned home. About 100 meters to the house, I saw a person sitting outside of our house. I couldn't see clearly, but I knew that this person was going to be my father. And as I moved closer, lo and behold, it was my father sitting outside the house. Wahala. And then I saw a Ghana must go just by his legs, and I couldn't anymore. My father cited me, and he carried that Ghana must go and he threw it at me. He said, everything that you own, house of clothing is inside there. You have given yourself freedom. Go, bye-bye. And my father went inside, subhanAllah. Meanwhile, my first friend went inside, no problem, no father waiting for him. My second friend went inside, no problem, no father waiting for him. Now I had a gun, I must go, and I had been given freedom. Go, don't come back here. What do I do? I went to knock on doors. I called other fathers from the mosque to come and plead to my father. My father, after much pleading, said that, okay, it's all forgiven, but that I must spend that night outside of that house, that I wasn't coming into that house that night. The following day, I could come back. Where was I going to go? Pleading and pleading. Eventually, my father allowed me to come inside. Right? Now, Ibad Allah, needless to say that I received the beating of my life. Needless to say that that became the first and the last time that I went into a cinema. Was it the case that my father actually wanted me to go away? No, not at all. He could not have wanted me to go away. He needed to make a point in the strongest manner imaginable. And that was the manner in which my father chose to make that point. And that point he registered with me so much. So much so that when I was now married and in England, and I went to my first cinema in England, I remembered that story from going back home. And I would tell people that when my profile was read, Uncle Fola made the reference to my first class honors degree. I would tell people that it was that night that I made that first class because my two friends did not go beyond secondary school. The two friends that we went to that cinema, right? So I was the only one who went as far as university. It was that night that I made that first class. It was that night that I secured that scholarship. It was that night that I made that master's degree. It was that night that I passed that professional examination. It was that night that I became a fellow of my professional body. And this imam that is talking to you today, it was that night that the seed of that imamship was sown because I did not cross my father anymore. Meanwhile, neither of my parents ever stepped into a classroom. Neither of them could write their own names. So potentially, I was not a child that was meant to be anywhere close to university, right? My father changed the story of us that night and three out of the four of us that I gave birth to, we passed through the university 
of Lagos. And that was how I believe that my parents, they wrote that story. So if I, Allah, I am concluding, you know, you will find parents who had four children, three of these children would have turned out as model children and one will go his or her own way, different from all others. Have the parents failed? No, you haven't failed as parents. That is just the trial that Allah has chosen to send your way at that point in time. What then do you do? Do I? Do I? Remember the power of dua. Dua works. Indeed, I say to people that I believe that the life that I live, the way that I have turned out, is as a result of the dua of my parents. So pray for your children. Pray for their guidance. Pray for their safety. Pray for their success. And one of the most popular du'a regarding family is that which you find in Surah Tole Quran, Quran chapter 25, verse 74. Habla na Imam. O Lord, grant that our spouses and our children be a comfort to our eyes and give us the grace to be leaders to those who are conscious of you. Do this dua for your children. And for me, the ultimate dua in terms of parent-children relationship is that which we find in Surah Tule Ahkav, Quran chapter 46, verse 15, when Allah says, Rabbi awzani an ashkura ni'imataka allati an'amta alayya we are actually encouraged to say this dua when we turn the age of 40. It is there in the Quran, chapter 46, verse 15. My Lord, and this dua, it connects us to our parents and it connects us to our children as well. Yes, my, my Lord. Oh, you wish. Thank you very much. Same thing. Okay. My Lord, enable me to be, to be grateful for your favor upon me and upon my parents and to do righteous work which you would approve of. Then make righteous my offsprings. Indeed, I have repented and I have believed. So in this dua, we pray for our parents, we pray for ourselves, and we pray for our children as well. So to all parents listening to me, who may have challenges with one child or another, and who may have tried everything, then remember the power of dua. Dua does work. I beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our children joys of our eyes, to grant us the wherewithal to be the right parents over them, and to let us live long to them benefit when these children would have turned out to be righteous children as well. And for those who are gone, for Allah to reunite all of us in Jannah to live for it house. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه إلى أخير وسلم تسليما كثيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته um by the time you are concluding we had 668 people on the platform um, at a time when we thought the internet was going to be a negative factor today. Alhamdulillah. In your inimitable manner, 
you have um, given us this presentation on parenting, um, making it clear yeah. that the fact that we preach does not make us perfect. Every Ramadan, when this opportunity comes again, I say to myself, what is my, what is my locus? I'm not an imam. I'm not a preacher. I'm not learned. Why should we continue to do this? Um, but we continue to do it and people continue to respond. Thank you for making me a bit more comfortable this morning that uh, even as imperfect as I am, I could still carry on in the belief that all we are doing is making an effort um, and in hope, hopefully in the process, continue to purify ourselves or strengthen ourselves. Second point I want to make it is, um, again, I refer to your inimitable way, and I ask the question, what is the purpose of our religion if we do not apply its teachings to our daily conduct? Imam Jimo dares to relate the teachings of Islam to our day-to-day -day lives. It draws as much from our immediate society as from his own personal lives and thereby injects authenticity into what he tells us. Um, we are not ranking imams. We are not um, rating them first class or second class of a, as the case may be. We are just evaluating the one that is in front of us. And they refer to the event of last year when he made his preaching. Just as he received calls, I also received calls, and my wife received calls. Um, I guess the action of this year will reflect a view of that lecture to Imam Jima. And that's why he's back on the platform. But because I'm not a lecturer, let me um, go straight to the question that we've asked, that we've been asked to ask Imam. Can you categorize Islamically what parenting style is applicable at what age range our kids of our kids' lives? There are people who like templates and Templates are not wrong if it makes things easier for people to do. Um, age zero to two, I guess that's what the questioner is trying to say. What do we do? Um, I'll, added to that question is to also look at the times that we are in. At the time that your father did what he did to you, nobody in our society or even in other societies that we know, talked about mental health. Um, I was raised by a father who beat me and beat my siblings too when we did something wrong. I mean, we were not, um, it wasn't like it was, it was brutal or it was a sadist, no. When he came to the conclusion that what we did was wrong, he applied punishment. And the punishment that was known to us or known to him at that time, was um, beating us. We had the whip in the house at Ori. Um, and we cry and try not to do that again. And some of us will still do that again. I will beat you again. Today, um, all this has led to a mental health environment. We are even at work saying to somebody who makes a presentation to you that this is substandard person comes to you and says, I'm leaving. I didn't like the way you talked to me. Um, it's just part of the environment in which we have found ourselves, and we must address it. Uh, I hope in answering that question of categories, you'll extend it to the, the role of mental health in, in, in raising children. Um, the second question is also, one of information, really. Can you give us 
the dual verses that you are suggesting, the chapter and the verses, the chapter and the verses, um, the Surah of Quran, prayer for children. That's Quran 25, verse 27. And then Quran 46, verse 15. I don't know whether you have more. I mean, those are the two that we've been able to uh, bring out for you. Those are the two questions we have at the moment. And as we receive more, we will talk, we will um, present them to you. Thank you very much. Iman. Uh oh. Alhamdulillah, I'm done. Kathiran, Tajiban, Ubarakan, Fair. Um, the first question is to categorize what parenting method is applicable at uh, different stages. The first thing to note is that there are people who are actually experts on this, right? I think those would be better people to admonish or to advise people than uh, this imam who is talking to us. Indeed, it's a profession for some people. There are people who specialize in guidance and counseling and then uh, similar things as well. Secondly, uh, we all live in societies and we would see among, around us people who have successfully parented their children. And then, uh, yeah, uh, I think there will be more value in talking to people like this rather than uh, imam uh, giving uh, uh, specifications. Our parents, as Uncle Fola just said, our parents applied the parenting style that was uh, known to be right during their own time, right? But then our children are children of a different generation entirely. In this, those of us who are watching from the UK, from America, you would never have beaten your children because there is real danger in beating a child in a society like that. The state may take the child away from you, right? Having said this, um, we owe it to our children to live the kind of life that we want them to live. When they step out of bounds, which every child will, to react and not let that moment go so that they know that this you do not do. Part of the parenting style is to deny them of something. You are not going to watch television today for this which you have done, right? And if that child misses his or her favorite program, right, that impacts on him or her, and he wouldn't want that to happen again or to seize a piece of toy that is very important to that child. You are not playing with this gadget today for doing this. Or there is an outing. You are not going to go to this outing for doing this and that. In doing all this, let us also remember the, the power of prayers. Also, the parenting style that works in Nigeria may not work in the UK. The one that works in America may not work in Nigeria. So what parenting style we adopt would also be a function of the society in which we are growing up or we grew up. On the issue of uh, mental health, I actually hope that sometime in the future we will get a chance to, because, uh, to, to do a talk on Islam. I have a talk that is titled Islam, Muslims, and Mental Health. And uh, I'm sure it answers some of these questions. A lot of us Muslims, erroneously, we believe that being believers, we cannot suffer from mental health. No, we can suffer from mental health. And yet, what we regard as insensitive reaction from people can drive us over the edge. Just recently in England, this must be in the last one month, also, a school principal took her own life because the mm. education authorities' assessment of the school, right, rated the school below the standard that was acceptable mm. to the governors of the school, the school board, right? And this was too much 
for this person who presided over the affairs of that school, and she took her own life, so much so that assessors were now going to be subjected to training on taking into consideration. But if you are a school assessor and a school has done badly, poorly, how do you say a school has done poorly other than to say a school has done poorly? If a school is being managed wrongly, how do you say a school is being wrongly managed other than to say a school is being managed wrongly? So the assessors wrote their report. It was not favorable to the school and the person took our own life. So what do you do in that regard? A few people have asked for references uh, as the people are asking, people are putting them on the platforms as well. So people have been responding to that. If you go through the chats, you will see some of the references. I think that answers the two questions for now. Yes. The next one is First of all, a point of correction, the first um, dua for children is Quran 46, verse 15. The second one is Quran 25, verse 74. That is what he gave us today. And if he has more, uh, he can give us before the end of the of this session. What are the instances upon which a parent can disown his child in Islam? Okay. I think this takes us back to last year to an extent as well. In Islam, you cannot disown a child. It is, uh, it is forbidden to disown a child. Your child is your child. However much of a trial Allah may have made that child to be, you cannot disown a child. Just as you cannot disinherit. Indeed, disinheriting a child means disowning that child. In Islam, you cannot disinherit a child unless that child has left the religion of Islam, in which case, not only can the child not inherit from you, you know, parents can also inherit from their children if the children would die before them. But parents also cannot inherit from a child who died as a non-Muslim. Having said this, none of these positions is absolute, right? Our teachers will tell us that positions like this, when brought in front of a, a panel of Sharia experts, they will consider the circumstances and then reach final positions. But generally speaking, you cannot disinherit, you cannot disown a child in Islam. Your child is your child. Thank you, um, Imam. We we'll soon... Thank you very much, Imam. There is a, there are a couple more questions that came. What is the understanding of the saying of the prophet that the child belongs to the husband for a married woman? I, I, what is the understanding of the uh -huh. saying of the, of the prophet peace be upon him that the child belongs to the husband for a married woman? Um, number two, how do we teach Gen Z children who have a sense of entitlement, the concept of gratitude and contentment? Those are the two questions that came. I think the first question relates to the owner of the pet. What the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that the owner of the pet is the owner or the father of the child. This applies to a married lady who got into an adulterous relationship and then had a child through that relationship. In the Sharia states, right, 100% of the times, the husband of that lady, the one to whom she is legally Sharia married to, is the owner of all the children that the child that that, uh, that lady has while being in his house. 
even where it is established that that child was not given birth to by the husband, the legal husband, the illegal husband in the Sharia state will never, ever be given a child, given birth to by a lady that is married to somebody. And this is the rationale behind this. In Islam, a child is regarded as a profit, a benefit of marriage, right? So a man who had an affair with a married lady will be denied that profit. And that is all that is happening there. Will never be allowed to profit from that adulterous relationship that he had with that person. So we may then ask, so what happens where the legal husband, knowing that this child is not my child, so what happens to him? Yes, he also has a right to reject that child, in which case that child become, that is in Islam, they call that child the child of his or her mother. She, mm. He or she will be a child of the mother rather than the father. So we bear the mother's name, right? And where the mother is not available for whatever reason, then the child becomes the child of the state. So all this is in the Sharia state. And of course, for a man to come forward and say this child, given birth to by this married person is my child, the guy is going to go through the Sharia punishments which may be death depending on his circumstances. If he is married, a married person who commits zina in the Sharia would have to be stoned to death or to be put to death one way or another. So in which case, it may be the two of them, the adulterous lady and the man that will be put to death, in which instance, the child belongs to the state. But Islamically, no person who has an adulterous relationship with a lady married to a person at that time would be given the results of uh, that pregnancy. And that is what that hadith means. Number two is uh, Generation Z in terms of uh, gratitude. It's all and part of a uh, sense of uh, entitlement. I mean, I, I imagine that uh, it is the uh, children of uh, those of us middle class, upper middle class, that have a sense of entitlement. I mean, a child that is struggling to find breakfast, where is this sense of entitlement going to come from? It is part of our parental responsibilities for them to know that, uh, and I remember one of our, uh, in, in fact, I mean, I'm sure Uncle Fala would excuse me, for saying this, you said this to us in your house that uh, you say to your children that don't let me ever hear you say, what do you give to a man who has everything? That don't let me ever hear that. That you expect gifts from them, right? Regardless of what Allah may have blessed you with and stuff like that. So this we all have to say to our children, right? And it is actually part of teaching, parenting. To let our children, the, one of my children came home on holiday from England, and I was telling her that next time you are coming, you have to bring something for this, for this, and for this. And that is me doing parenting, being an African parent now. An English parent will not be likely to say to that same child, bring for this, bring, and I was quick to add that uh, it doesn't have to be something which costs a lot of money. No, something very simple, which is symbolic. Let them know that you remember them and you appreciate them as your aunties and as your uncles. So to children who have a sense of belonging, sometimes we deny them and let them know that you are not deserving of this, right? And we train them that when we are in our 70s and in our 80s, it may be time for you to start to provide for us as well. Thank you very much. We have um, the questions are now rolling in. What are the specific roles of mothers in cooperating with fathers in raising 
righteous children. That's number one of this batch. Number two, what is the application of 777 in Islamic tarbiyah? First, second, and third seven years in raising children with respect to stages in exposure to, so, uh, to social media. That is question two. I, I have no clue, but I can assure you that I read it as the writer wrote it. Number three, how do you balance the um, influences of living abroad and raising children while trying to instill your religious and cultural norms? How do you balance this? Number four, Imam, what is your view on communal parenting? Where should... Thank you. Where should we draw the line? What is your view on communal parenting and where should we draw the line? Thank you. Okay. The first one, role of mothers in raising children. Um, I think culturally, whether you are in Africa, you are in England, you are in America, you will find that the mothers have more influence on the children than the fathers. And the main reason is, one, the father is here and there and there and there, right? Perhaps looking for sustenance for the family. Secondly, children are naturally attracted to their mothers than they are to their fathers. And as I said two years ago, right, it was in reaction to a question as well that where there is a breakup, of a marriage, right? You will find the children naturally sympathize with their mothers more than they do with their fathers, even where the mother may have been the main reason for the breakup of the marriage, the sympathy naturally goes to the mother and they gravitate towards their mothers without necessarily um, rejecting their fathers. So mothers have a lot of roles to play in the raising of children. The mother is there more than the father is. The father is absent more than the mother is. The father's primary role is to also provide for the family. Indeed, in an ideal Islamic setting, the woman wouldn't be spending one penny of our own money to raise the children. And I emphasize ideal, right? So the man who is here and there running up and down, traveling today, tomorrow, and all, cannot have the same degree of influence on the raising of these children. You find that it is mothers that tend to take them to school. It is mothers that attend PTA. It is mothers that attend Children's Day. It is mothers that do this. And the closer they are, the more of these roles they play, the bigger influence they have on the children. Having said that, both parents are mutually responsible for raising the children and making sure they turn out to be good children. But for me, I think the role of the mother is more than that of the father without saying the father should uh, abandon their responsibilities. The mother is the homekeeper. And the homekeeper is the one who decides, who determines, who influences what happens in the home. Number two question, on the application of uh, 777, uh, what this means is that uh, our children up to the age of seven, right? Obviously, their needs are different from the second seven years of their age. And then by the third seven years, they are 21 years of age. Some of them university graduates, for instance. For instance, our children may be sharing rooms, children of different sexes. When they reach the age of seven, right, we have to separate their beds 
and we have to put them in different rooms. You don't have a seven year, or I think I can't remember if that is seven or 10 years of age. It's one or the other, right? You don't have a seven year old boy sharing a room or a bed with a seven year old girl. I know that can be challenging to people of a uh, very little means, but this is what this means. And then by that latter seven, they are actually now adults. Or by the second seven, they are still teenagers. They, they were toddlers, now, now teenagers, and now adults. And of course, what they need in terms of admonition is different. If we assume a case of a divorce, for instance, in the first seven years of the child, the child Islamically is expected to be with the mother. Because at that age, the person who can truly look after a child up to that age is the mother, right? From between the ages of seven and 10, they can consider letting the child go to his or her father. But if it's a baby girl, for instance, I'm sure 90% of people listening to me would rather that baby, that girl will still be with her mother rather than her father. How does a man alone raise a seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-old girl, right? So in those early stages, the mother is uh, Islamically the custodian of the child. From the ages of 10 upward, we can consider letting the child go to their father. And when they become an adult, then how we relate to them, we now relate with them, which, I mean, as adults. Uh, that's to the best of my understanding is uh, what that question is about. How do we balance the influence of living abroad and raising a child with uh, our cultural upbringing? Okay, so somebody just wrote online that uh, the formula says that the first seven years you play with them and the second seven years you teach them as well. That's an additional answer from the, from the screen. Now, how about, the third, abroad, how about the third seven years? Yeah, I said they are now adults. They are now okay. adults. Leave, so you, re so you relate them. with them as adults. <laughs> no, you relate with them as, as, adults, as adults, very much still in need of guidance. If we assume 21 years of age, a 21-year-old is still a baby in relative terms. And that is actually quite a crucial stage of their lives as well. Balancing living abroad with raising children and then with a cultural uh, situation. Uh, religious, religious norms. Yes, religious norms. Uh, I would say to people that uh, my generation in England was the lucky generation in that we got to England at a time that... Uh, there was consciousness of Islam. And how, how do we know this? The generation that we met in England, those of our parents who went to England in their 60s, some in their 50s, and who had children there. Generally speaking, those children grew up to be real English children with almost no religion in their lives. Would you blame these parents? No, you can't blame these parents. These parents are not our first or anything like that. A typical parent who goes, who goes to England to study, right, would, uh, would, uh, not, would not, is not likely to have been an alpha kind of parent. Meanwhile, in the environment that they live, Islam was almost totally lacking. And how do you raise a child alone as a Muslim child? Indeed, the practice then was to leave these children with white English nannies outside of London, right? A parent living in London, the nanny is living in Manchester. And it is this person in Manchester who is raising this child. The, the parent goes to see the child. By the time my generation got to England, there was real consciousness of Islam. I should mention that in my first year in England, 1989, January 1989, ah, I, the, 
Ramadan came that year, and it was my personal consciousness as a 25-year-old then, right, with full consciousness of Islam, that made me to know that it was the month of Ramadan, that Ramadan had come. The people around me did not know that it was Ramadan, and I'm talking about fellow Nigerians. But today, with our children in the same England, it's not possible for Ramadan to come and people who don't know that Ramadan has come. Now, trying to balance that lifestyle there with culture, I'm telling you, it is tough. And nobody will pretend that it is not tough. For instance, I have never beaten any of my children. And that was because we mainly raised them in England, even though we returned to Nigeria and then uh, they relocated with us in Nigeria. But because we started from England, I think my first child was what year old when we returned to Nigeria was uh, 20 years old. And the one after him was a uh, 13 years old, right? So you've raised a child to the age of 20 in an English way. You are not suddenly going to get to Nigeria and you are now Nigerian who smacks them. Till this day, I have never hit any of my children, right? And my children fear their mother more than they do me, right? And in a way, I also sort of hide behind their mother because their mother can be tough with them and they know that this mother can be tough. I am the one that they can get away with things with. So coming back to Nigeria, striking that balance can be tough. Another balance to strike is the issue of uh, religion. These children went to Madrasa in England where they've been taught that uh, to nail down to somebody is uh, forbidden in Islam. To do what we call dobale is forbidden in Islam. And before we relocated to Nigeria, we would bring these children on holiday. The children would be caught between greeting the proper way that the Nigerian parent would say, I want my leko, want to, and greeting the way they have been told in England, where even the, their professors in universities on a first name basis. So, so striking that balance, I had to start teaching my children to say sa to people and to say ma to people because no child says sa to anybody in England. That word does not exist. So it's so, such a formal word that it doesn't exist at all. That, 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 thank you, sir. Thank you is thank you. There's no thank you, sir. There's no thank you, ma. But getting to Nigeria, we have to start teaching them to say thank you, sir, and thank you, ma and stuff like that. As such, when people will come on holiday from England to Nigeria, and you are talking to them, and they are responding, and you are expecting to hear that, sir, ma, and they are not saying it, I can very easily understand that where they are coming from, there is no sir, and there is no ma. And I'll relate one more personal example to you. My wife is listening to. When my third child, who was my second daughter, was going to go to school and join the older daughter in school. And I was trying to do the Nigerian thing. And, uh, and I was telling her that uh, you have to call your senior sister because there, I think there, there is a, uh, is this five or seven year gap? I'm, I'm going to get into trouble with my wife for not even remembering this now. Uh, there's a five year gap between them and I and I said to her, you know, you can't call your older sister by a first name. You can you, you have to call her sister Amina. Sister Amina. Amina is listening as well. Um it wasn't a name for her that I was telling to call her older sister by name that was protesting. It was the senior sister that was to be called sister, you know, that was protesting. And she said to her exact sentence was, how am I, daddy, how am I going to be the only child whose sister calls sister something in the entire school? And as she was saying this, she was on the verge of crying. And that was how serious it was to her that uh, no, 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 no. And in 2022, when we went on holiday and all of us were together, 
and I was telling them that, uh, you know, you guys can't keep calling each other first name. Something the, the two oldest were the first to reply that, uh, no, thank you, daddy. No, I'm fine. No, I don't want to be brother cousin. I don't want to be sister. No, 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 no. It is first name. It is first name basis. And all of them remain on first name basis. So how do we how do we find that balance? To my child, my older child, it was an awkward thing for a young sister to have to call her by name. So what is right in England may be wrong in Nigeria. What is right in Nigeria may be wrong in Nigeria. I guess we have to do what is right in the environment in which we live. And if we talk Islam, if you go to the Arab countries, people don't call themselves brother, sister, whatever. People go on a first name basis as well. So you will find that this is more cultural than religion. And what is right in certain societies is what is right. But it can be a balance that is tough to achieve. View on communal parenting. Communal parenting only works in, uh, it's only applicable to Africa. As we know, there's nothing like a communal parenting overseas. Yorubas will say, Oju konin tomo, iba oju. No, oju konin bimo, iba oju. Onin to, omono. And that is how we were raised. And that remains, with the exception of the likes of us, living in Lekki, living in uh, Ikoyi. That is how children are raised till today in places where the likes of me were born. And it actually does work. It does work. When a parent of a neighbor, an older neighbor who see a child and tell that child off, and that telling off would have as much impact on that child as being told off by our parents. That can only be something good. It is encouraged and I, I, I urge those who are in a position to subject themselves or children to communal uh, parenting to do so, of course, to the right communal parenting. And uh, I think that's it for now. Thank you very much. I, um, should, add, I should add, sir, that uh, regarding the issue of uh, the owner of the bed, I did mention that I was in the Sharia state. Of course, in our own state here, where Sharia is now applicable, once a man proves the paternity of a child, then is the legal father of that child. The man is going to take his child. So that owner of the bed wouldn't apply where the Sharia is uh, not applicable. Thank you. Um, we have the next five six questions and i'll ask them all together because they will be the last set um we we'll always work with time here and um closing at 12 is still a promise who takes custody of a child after a divorce number one number two i'd like to know at which age we should be exposing our children to social media Number two. Number three, what is the position of Islam? And what advice to a father who discovered that the three grown children, three daughters, that he trained to become university graduates are not his children? And what is the position of Islam? And what advice do you have for a father who discovered that the three grown children, in this case daughters, three daughters, that he trained to become university graduates are not his children through DNA and angry confession by his wife, though he has a young son of his own. Number four. What is the inheritance right of a widow who bore no child with her deceased husband in Islam? Let me just, you may address it, but last week we were addressed on inheritance for one hour, 45 minutes. We have the uh, presentation of the scholar who addressed us, every aspect of inheritance was touched. 
So if you want to touch it, fine. But if you don't want to touch it, uh, you can leave it out, which will be my counsel. But I'll leave the decision to you. Number five, what happens in the case of an orphan? I guess it's still inheritance, and we've discussed that. Maybe the person asking the question was not on the platform. Uh, the last one, is it appropriate for a mother to hold the father responsible when their children are not following um, their religious beliefs? And lastly, should parents have to quarrel or interject one parent when one parent is holding a child? Those are the questions we'll be able to take today. And um, I would give them um, all the time that is left, leaving two minutes to the speaker. In other words, the next five minutes to the speaker, to, the, to, to our guest speaker. And then okay. we, can, we can pray for us at the end of all the questions if there are no housekeeping issues to announce. Thank you. Okay, the first question is on the custody of a child after divorce. Uh, up till the age of, I think, seven, the mother has custody as far as uh, the Sharia is concerned. I wouldn't know what applies in uh, our own case where the Sharia is not in use, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me if our legal system would uh, support this as well, because up to that age, seven, eight, nine, ten, the, 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 the natural person to raise a child of such ages is the mother. Once the child has attained beyond that seven years of age, um, you can discuss as to whether the mother continues to have custody of the child or whether the child goes to the father. Of course, a discussion would have to take place. And uh, where is the child going to is also important very much because the person who legally has a right of custody may be the wrong house for a child to grow up in. And that much is very obvious to everything. But in the initial stages of a child, the mother has custody. What age to expose children to social media? Our children are a generation of uh, social media children. And we find that uh, even in terms of their school work, they will need a degree of exposure to social media to be able to do certain homework. So for me, um, once a child is old enough to be able to handle a computer on his on our own, right? Then that is the age to expose them, except that they are not exposed without some monitoring. Also, you know, we can put uh, restrictions on the laptops or the systems that the children are exposed to as well, so that they are unable to go to certain sites. These are some of the precautions that we as children, we have to. And then children cannot be in a position in which at 11 p.m., 12 midnight, 1 a.m., they are still on their laptop and they are doing what pleases them while the parents are in another place. No, we will be failing in our responsibility. Otherwise, I cannot say that this is the age that children should be exposed to social media. Position of Islam, on three daughters trained to university level only to be discovered that they were the wrong children. If the father of those children is alive and willing to claim his children, in our society, you would have no choice but to let the children go to their fathers. However, children who have been trained to university level they would have a say on this. And I trust you, I assure you rather, they will be likely to stay with the father 
who has trained them to university level because that is who they know as father a father who suddenly turned up from nowhere after they were already graduates they are not likely to want to recognize this father in the islamic state the father would train them under the, the concept of owner of the bed the father would train them remains their father even though not biologically they will never be allowed to go to this other father. So to any father who finds himself in this situation, I can only sympathize with them because it must be a devastating thing. I mean, for all of us who are parents here, right? To imagine that sometimes somebody turns up to say that they are the father of our children. Let us imagine how devastating that would be for us. Right, so it would be a devastating thing, and they can only sympathize with such father. But subjected to the say so of those children, right, they will be likely to prefer their the father who raised them rather than uh, and also how many 21 year old plus want to be known as having been given to the wrong father. I'm sure they will want to protect their mother as well, and rather this was kept hush hush and then remaining the father of who they know as their father. I mean, it's a different thing entirely if the biological father turns out to be one super rich person who can give them everything in life. I don't know. That can sway their decisions. But if the father turns up, he wants their children, and they want to go, then they have to go. Inheritance rights of a widow with no child. As Uncle Fala said, this was treated last week, and it's in the Quran as well, in Quran chapter 4, Surah to Nisa. Uh, there, are, there are verses, I can't remember them top of my head, in which cases of inheritance, uh, in which inheritance was treated. And uh, it is in the Yoruba system that a widow can be disinherited. Under Islam, having a child is no condition for inheriting your late husband is a right which Allah has given. And uh, uh, what you get as a person with no child, of course, will be more than what you get as a widow with children, because part of the inheritance is going to your children as well. And uh, these lectures are always shared as well and i'm sure if that has already if that is not uh, shared yet it will be shared inshallah so to all those saying they want copies of uh, this lecture the lectures are always shared and you can find them on facebook as well because we have audience there we have audience on facebook as well and on youtube it is it is live stream so, on youtube I, I actually meant to say youtube when I said Facebook. This lecture is being live streamed on YouTube as well, and we have audience there. So just put the title and put my name, you will find the lecture. And often in terms of uh, inheritance, while the question is not entirely clear, the right of an orphan under the Sharia is never denied to him or her. It may be that the child has not attained the age in which he or she is able to handle wealth, in which case there will be a trustee or trustees appointed to look after the wealth until the child will reach the age that they can pass it on. And yesterday I gave a lecture, a live lecture somewhere, and the question it's was well asked, can the people... Can the people who are trustees, can they, for instance, invest uh, such inheritance? Yes, they can. But I advise that it should not be a unilateral decision of somebody. Other people who have a degree of say should be made to be aware because anything business can go wrong. And if it goes wrong and you took a unilateral decision, then you would have a tough time convincing people that uh, you didn't misappropriate that money. Uh, appropriate to hold father responsible where children 
are not religious. Yes, the father has the primary responsibility because he's the head of the house and is expected to guide himself, guide his wife, and guide his family as a whole. However, mothers are equally responsible, and it is possible that in houses, and there are many houses like that, you find that the woman is more religious than the husband. You find that the woman is the one actually drugging the father of the baby to religion as well, then in which case the mother may have a bigger role to play. But fathers and mothers are equally responsible. The final question is about one parent interjecting when a child is being scolded. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it is not to write, not in the presence of the child. There may be a genuine reason for one or the other of the parents to caution the other parents, but let it not be in the presence of the child. Our time is up. It's 12.01 now, and I guess we'll be closing now. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank the, the listeners today for exemplary behavior. We had one or two cases of uh, people unmuting themselves, but generally this, this was a lot better than, than what we experienced last week. I hope we can keep it up. Number two, all our um, lectures will be live streamed. This 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 was live streamed on YouTube, and so whoever wants I just praise the audience, and um, that <laughs> happened. But I will not withdraw the praise. Thank you. The um, is live streamed, and at the end of this lecture you will find it there. So the burden of sending recording to, to, to you does not arise. It's right there on YouTube. And I can, I can confirm that. Um, we'll, next week, Sunday, 10 a.m., we'll start again. And we'll try to end at noon, as we did today. But I want to thank on your behalf, uh, Imam Najim Jimo, uh, and pray that may Allah continue to expand his chest for him uh, so that we can continue to understand what he tells us. And the the, the prayer uh, be upon him uh, uh, increases knowledge and challenge us. It's not everybody that will tell us what we like or what we want. We get challenged and um, we keep pushing the envelope and we ourselves must find a purpose in that which which it is that we are listening to. Otherwise, spending two hours on a Sunday, five weeks in Ramadan, and Ramadan in Ramadan out, and we don't have any changes to our lives, is is really scary. Um, for how hardened or inflexible we have become. And I pray for myself, for my household, and for yourselves that um, may Allah hear our prayers. May some of Amen. If we can't receive all of them, let some abide with us so that we can say that we have moved from the point we at which we started forward to, to, to some point. I mean, with the distances that we move will vary. Uh, please pray for us, Imam, and let us close for today. Thank you for allowing me to host you again. Um, and we will call on you again. Uh, we don't know when, but hope that when we do, you will answer us. Thank you. Allahumma Rabbana Hablana mena azwajina wa dhuriyatina kurata ayun wa jalna lilimuttaqina imama Rabbana la tuzik kulubana bada idha daytana wa hablana min ladunka rahmatan inna kanta liwahab Rabbi awzani أنا أشكر نعمتك التي أنعمت علي وعلى والدي وأن أعمل صالحا أن ترضاه وأصلح لي في دوريتي إني تبت إليك وإني من المسلمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه إلى خير وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك 
رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Thank you. That is the end of the lecture and I will then just end it and then